By 1885, the original log cabin was but a wing of a low, rambling ranch house set in a shady grove of cottonwoods. The house faced east toward the, brown, the barns, the corrals, and the mountains. Several miles to the west, dark as a ship's prow against the sky, loomed the northern point of Mesa Verde. Long rows of white three-board fences enclosed the nearest pastures and corrals. Everything in the house spelled simplicity, comfortable use, and good cheer. Blue denim strips sewed into one big piece carpeted the floors of the bedrooms, and under these were layers of straw. A girl, staying at the ranch one time and walking barefoot across her room, cried out in delight, It feels just like walking on moss! Most of the furniture was homemade, crude but serviceable, and for each bedstead there was a corn shuck mattress. In the winter time, Marion Wetherill put goose feather ticking over the mattresses, supplied plenty of hand quilted bedding, and added color by giving each bed a scarlet blanket at the foot. For cold mornings and cold feet, she laid Navajo blankets over the denim carpeting. Shy in the presence of strangers, Marion Wetherill took little part in the conversation when visitors came to the ranch. She was a solid, warm presence, however, and able with one word or two to create an atmosphere of friendliness. Often, after guests had settled down or were talking easily, someone would notice that Marion had slipped unnoticed from the room. She might be outdoors, fussing over a bed of flowers, or directing the Ute yardman, who cut firewood and tended her cows and chickens. More often, she would be found in the kitchen, an apron around her ample waist. In the stove light, her features were strikingly similar to her son Richard's, the cheekbones wide, a firm jawline more square than round. Her hair she wore in tight curls, quite gray something like a cap. Several fireplaces heated the ranch house, the large stone hearth in Benjamin's room being the favorite family gathering place. This room, sometimes called the den, had bunks along one wall used by the father one or two of his sons. It was here that visitors to the ranch were drawn, sometimes unsuspecting, to listen to old, old Benjamin's Chisholm Trail stories. These always ended with laments about the illness that now incapacitated him. Minor clashes, a shooting or knifing, the theft of a cow, jeering oaths from a drunken cowboy aggravated the relations between the Utes and white settlers for several years after the Wetherills began ranching in the valley. There was the ever-present fear that out of some small incident might come a buzzing hornet's nest of Indians with deaths and burnings before soldiers could be summoned from Fort Lewis, 25 miles away. Actually, the Utes probably were in greater danger. The Wetherill men were among the very few who were on good terms with the Indians. The Utes had nothing to fear from this Quaker family. They learned that the Wetherills desired their friendship, and when they came to the Alamo Ranch on one pretext or another, there was no mistaking the sincerity of their welcome. No Indian was turned away hungry. More than once, a sick Indian was taken in by Marion Wetherill and nursed back to health. In return, the Utes permitted the Wetherills alone among the pioneer ranches, to run their cattle in the Mancos and Branch Canyons. One day, in the early 1880s, a small band of Utes filed into the little Mancos schoolhouse, lined up in a glowering silent row at the rear of the room. The teacher, who was hardly more than 16 years old, fought down her panic as long as she could, continuing the lesson in a shaky voice. Under the Utes' watchful stare, the teacher's young teacher's nerve ebbed away. She dismissed her pupils for the day hoping that their leaving would not be the signal for some horrible violence. Nothing happened. The frightened youngsters silently walked out, and the Utes just as silently departed. It was one of those weird little incidents so familiar in the valley, which passed harmlessly. The worst fright experienced by people of the valley occurred six years after the Wetherills settled at Mancos. It was remembered afterwards as the Beaver Creek Massacre. Clara Ormiston knew two of the ranchers involved, but refused to reveal their names. In early June 1885, a large encampment of Utes gathered at Ute Mountain, at the western entrance of McElmo Canyon, about a half a day's ride from Mancos. From this large gathering, one family, a man, his squaws, and two children, moved to a camp on Beaver Creek, 15 miles south of the settlement at Dolores. There they rested to allow their five horses and small band of sheep to fatten on the good grass. One early morning... Soon after, a party of three or four ranchers surrounded the camp. Without warning, they opened fire with rifles. The way the story was told to me by one who was there, Miss Ormison said years later, the white men went to Beaver Creek with the sole idea of stealing the Utes' horses. When they fired into the camp, they killed the man, 
one of his two squaws, and then shot one of his children, a little boy. The woman, who had not been hit, put a buffalo robe over her head and ran for the cliffs. Somehow she managed to climb down the rocks, which rise steeply here above the Dolores River. One of the white men rolled stones over the side, but they bounced away without hitting her, and she swam the river and got away to Ute Mountain, where she told the Indians what happened. A war party was formed, setting out through McElmo Canyon in the direction of Mancos. Apparently, the first white settlers they came upon were the Gunther, or Gunther, family, who lived in a small cabin eight or ten miles west of the Alamo Ranch. Mrs. Ormiston described what occurred. The Utes swarmed around the house as night was falling, setting it on fire. When Mr. Gunther came home, when Mr. Gunther came to the door, they shot him, but before he died, he called to his wife to take their children and go out through another door. Mrs. Gunther was wearing only her nightgown, but in the darkness she slipped away. She escaped with her baby in one arm, and leading the other child by the hand. A rifle ball had hit her in the shoulder, covering her in blood, yet she managed to reach the banks of a gulch and hide until morning. When daylight came, she saw the Utes had left, and she took her children on to the next house, owned by a man named Woolly. News of the Gunther murder was carried to Fort Lewis, and the troops went to secure the scene with an agent. We were just as afraid of the Utes as could be, Miss Orison said, but I could see their side of it, too. We came in here and fired them out of the country, and they had a right to be resentful. George Menfee member of one of the first families to settle in Mancos, has recalled how the Beaver Creek affair and the Gunther murder spread panic through the valley. Everybody here was afraid of the Utes anyhow, and some of the ranchers sent their families to Durango for a week or two until things quieted down. But the Wetherill stayed. Even old B.K. and the boys refused to carry guns. They were very peaceable people. John Wetherill's wife, Louisa Wade Wetherill, related in Traders to the Navajo, how old Benjamin on a winter day rode into town with a Navajo blanket wrapped around his thin waist and shoulders. A friend warned him that he might be shot as a Ute. I'd as soon be shot as freeze to death, said Benjamin. Benjamin Wetherill always relied on common sense and the lessons of his own Quaker elders who taught him that violence usually begets more violence. He had not worn a six-shooter in Oklahoma Territory and did not propose to start now. His five sons adopted the same attitude. They were all expert marksmen, particularly Richard and Wynne, who both won trophies for skill in handling a rifle, and many times they brought home deer and wild turkey to add to the family larder. However, unless they were hunting game, Richard and his brothers almost never carried guns. Henry Honker, whose family came to Mancos in 1883 when he was 13 years old, remembered B.K. Wetherill as a kind and stiff-necked feller who wasn't afraid of Utes any more than anybody else. He wasn't afraid of nothing. Honaker never saw any of the Wetherill men wearing gun belts, but recalled that they sometimes packed rifles on their saddles. Several years after the Gunther murder, an exception to this dislike for bearing weapons was related by an eastern visitor to the Alamo Ranch. Frederick H. Chapin, author and lecturer, was a greenhorn. He noted, on the occasion when Richard Wetherill guided him on a trip through the camps of some of the Utes, who were openly unfriendly, that Richard carried a battered old revolver under his belt. There it remained, in spite of Indian threats, and perhaps just as well. Chapin implied that if the gun had been fired, Richard himself probably would have been the victim. Indians who knew the Wetherills, and in time most of the Utes in the vicinity of Mancos did, realized that this white family, in this white family, they had staunch friends. One old-time resident recalled a night when a clamor was heard along the Mancos River, close by the Alamo Ranch. Some of the damn Utes drunk and whooping it up, he thought. The Wetherills knew better. Down by the water in the shelter of the bank, they found three sick Indians, keening their distress in loud tones, and one of them all but dead from pneumonia. The Indians were taken back to the ranch, fed and given warm clothing, and in time were nursed back to health. And I feel like New York City Get me to the farm